I disobeyed Riley Kent. And then my coffee's not even open. Okay. I have my coffee today, so all is well in the world. Okay. All right. So figurative language, specifically similes and metaphors. You read my mind. We're not doing automatopoeia today. I'm going to focus on those two, similes and metaphors. But, oh, my goodness, it's been a while, actually, since we talked about figurative language. What is a simile? Sean, what's a simile? It's compare something using like or as. Okay. Oh, um, last year we had to make, I made a project and I did money with girls on trees and um, I bought this little tree, Christmas tree and I put money on it. What does that have to do with the simile? Oh, oh no, that's a It means something. Okay, Sean just told me a story about decorating a tree, I think. Uh, <laughs> with money. Because money, money. Oh, money grows on trees. Okay, so we decorate. Oh, his project last year when you guys did figurative language, you said money grows on trees. Okay, all right, I got you now. But that's not a simile because you're not comparing like us. Okay, what is a metaphor? Josie, what's a metaphor? It's um, comparing something that says that it is something else. All right. Well, I had my book yesterday. Who can give me an example of a metaphor? Fiona, give me an example of a metaphor. Um, an example of a metaphor. Um, I messed up. No. Um, I am so fast. I'm a cheetah. I'm so fast. I'm a cheetah. She almost did, but she didn't. I'm so fast. I'm a cheetah. Could she even just shorten that and say, I'm a cheetah? And what is Fiona, if she just said, I'm a cheetah, she's saying she is a cheetah. Is Fiona actually a cheetah? No. What is she trying to tell me? That she's fast. fast. fast because we know that cheetahs are the fastest animal. Sophie, give me another metaphor. I just want to say, whenever she said I was fast, I'm fast as a cheetah or something like that. That's um, um, my little sister and my little brother outside playing by the basketball hoop by the garage yesterday. My little brother ran towards the house and I told him to pull after him. She was literally lightning speed. So Sophie said her little sister was lightning. Is her sister lightning? No. What is she trying to say? That he's fast. She's fast. Okay. Give me a different metaphor, not comparing something to being fast. Give me something else. Um, Lily. It's raining cats and dogs. It's raining cats and dogs. I think that's more of an idiom. What is an idiom? Grayson, what's an idiom? It's something that really doesn't happen. Okay. So if you say that it's raining cats and dogs, it's not really raining cats and dogs. Right. It's just raining really hard. It's an exaggeration. It's, it's a, nope, it's not the exaggeration one. Okay. Idioms are a popular phrase, a common phrase, but they don't mean exactly what they say. Um, so if you're saying it's raining cats and dogs, you're saying it's raining hard. Um, because getting hit with a cat or a dog would be kind of painful if like a giant, think about a St. Bernard falling from the sky, like it would take you out. Um, even a small dog falling from the sky would probably knock you down. Um, so, um, another metaphor, let's see, somebody put something in the chatty poo. As loud as an air horn, is that a simile or a metaphor? Simile. Simile, how do you know? Because it's using like as. It's using as, good. But Josie says it would be the greatest day ever. I'm not sure, how far are they falling? Are we catching them or are they just landing and breaking all their legs and little arms? <laughs> Josie's face was like, oh, it was bad. Um, all right, so I agree, like just cats and dogs like everywhere sounds awesome because I'm a pet person too. Um, but if they're falling from the sky, I hope they're landing on like, Mattresses or something. Yeah, because... you chase the cats. yeah. Okay. Um, Zeke, give me an example. Life is a roller coaster. Life is a roller coaster. Oh. That's really bad. 
They're not well, they're they're roller coasters. There's lots of changes in your life. Okay, life is a roller coaster. What kind of figurative language would that be? Metaphor. 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 What is Zeke saying? Life, is life changes a lot. Life changes a lot. It, goes up and down. it has ups and downs. Okay. <laughs> Poor stories. Josie. Um, all right. Anybody else? Any examples of a simile goes. or a metaphor? She's, she's just like, I'm going to go check the weather. <laughs> um, all right. So today, when we go through Hatchet, I want us to be like, I spy on the figurative language. Okay. And afterwards on your worksheet, you can bet there's going to be some practice of similes and metaphors. Yeah, Jason. I know another simile. Another simile. One more and then we're going to read. It's not doing what chapter? Six. I'm as chubby as an elephant. Chubby as an elephant. <laughs> I'm as chubby as an elephant. Simile. 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 How do we know it's a simile? As. 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 What is Jason trying to say? He's fat. He's fat. <laughs> All right. Okay. He's not actually fat. All right. Oh, Zeke, apologize. It's not even true, by the way, like at all. Okay, chapter six. Here we go. Okay. You are a sloth. I'm as slow as a sloth. All right. Okay, enough. I'm closing the chat. Here we go. Chapter six. Two years before he and Terry had been fooling around down near the park where the city seemed to end for a time and the trees grew thick and came down to the small river that went through the park. It was thick there and he and seemed kind of wild and they had been joking and making things up and they pretended they were lost in the woods and talked in the afternoon about what they would do. Of course, they figured they'd have all sorts of goodies like a gun and a knife and fishing gear and matches so they could cut and fish and have a fire. I wish you were here, Terry, he thought, with a gun and a knife and some matches. In the park that time, they had decided the best shelter was a lean-to, and Brian set out now to make one up. Maybe cover it with grass or leaves or sticks, he thought. And he started to go down to the lake again where there were some willows he could cut down for braces. But it struck him that he ought to find a good place for the lean-to, and so he decided to look around first. He wanted to stay near the lake because he thought the plane, even deep in the water, might show up to somebody flying over, and he didn't want to diminish any chance he might have of being found. His eyes fell upon the stone ridge to his left, and he thought at first he should build his shelter against the stone. But before that, he decided to check out the far side of the ridge, and that was where he got lucky. Using the sun and the fact that it rose in the east and set in the west, he decided that the far side was the northern side of the ridge. At one time in the far past, it had been scooped by something, probably a glacier, and this scooping had left a kind of sideways bowl back in under a ledge. So think about what that imagery might look like, a, a bowl, but it's sideways. So it's kind of like that right it's like this okay so almost like a tiny shallow little cave almost okay um do, 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 do. at one time da, 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 back under okay sideways bowl back in under a ledge it wasn't very deep not a cave but it was smooth and made a perfect roof and he could almost stand in under the ledge he had to hold his head slightly tipped forward at the front to keep from hitting the top. Some of the rock that had been scooped out had also been pulverized by the glacial action. What do you think pulverized means? It is a vocab word, but let's go ahead and talk about it. Breaking? Um, yes, but even more than that. The rock had been pulverized and broken by the glacier action. Um, Zeke. Yeah, like pulverized is like broken, destroyed. Josie. I was going to say like turned up or something. Okay, torn up. Um, broken into or destroyed into like teensy tiny little 
particles. So if you pulverize something, you are destroying it to the teensiest possible pieces you could destroy something. So the rock was basically, yes, turned to sand or dust or something. It was like destroyed that much. Um, like disintegrated. Disintegrated, yeah, kind of like that. Okay, so it was pulverized by the glacial action, turned into sand, and now made a small sand beach that went down to the edge of the water in front and to the right of the overhang. This was his first good luck. No, he thought he had good luck in the landing, but this was good luck as well, luck he needed. Yeah. yeah. All he had to do was wall off part of the bowl and leave an opening as a doorway and he would have a perfect shelter, much stronger than a lean-to and dry because the overhang made a watertight roof. He crawled back in under the ledge and sat. The sand here was cool in the shade and the coolness felt wonderful to his face, which was already starting to blister and get especially painful on his forehead with the blisters on top of the swelling. Why does he have blisters and swelling on his forehead? Um, Who remembers? Um, Jason. The mosquito bites. Mosquito bites and what else? The sun, because he was out there. And the sunburn. He didn't have very good and water in a long, long time. And right, and nasty. he's dehydrated. And yeah, what else? Okay, and he banged his head on the steering wheel in the crash. Kendall, what else? The black, black flies. The black flies, okay, good. Yeah, he's got a ton of injuries that he's still kind of dealing with. He doesn't have any medicine or anything yet, so he's kind of just waiting for it to go away on its own. Can you imagine... Being that sore, not getting having your parents there to give you Tylenol or something um, like. I have a question. Not interested in that. Jason. Is he like down? Um, well, does he live near Latin America? Oh, no, he's in Canada. Oh, good. In Latin America, there's these sand flies that can leave you a huge infection, like right here. Like they can start. Like Jason was worried about sand fleas or flies. sand flies. Um, but those are, yeah, I don't think those are in Canada so much. Fiona. Well, typo, that happens. Okay, um, it was cool. Okay, so he had the blisters on the swelling. He was also still weak. Just the walk around the back of the ridge and the slight climb over the top had left his legs rubbery. It felt good to sit for a bit under the shade of the overhang in the cool sand. And now he thought if he just had something to eat, anything. He's sitting by a river. When he, he's sitting by a pond that has a dead pilot in it and a plane. When he had rested a bit, he went back down to the lake and drank a couple swallows of the water. He wasn't all that thirsty, but he thought the water might help to take the edge off his hunger. It didn't. Somehow the cold lake water actually made it worse, sharpened it. He thought of dragging in wood to make a wall on part of the overhang and picked up one piece to pull up, but his arms were too weak and he knew when that it wasn't just a crash and injury to his body and head. He was also weak from hunger. He would have to find something to eat. Before he did anything else, he would have to have something to eat. But what? Brian leaned against the rock and stared out at the lake. What in all of this was there to eat? He was so used to having food just be there, just always being there. When he was hungry, he went to the icebox or to the store or sat down at a meal that his mother had cooked. Oh, he thought, remembering a meal now. Oh, it was the last Thanksgiving last year. The last Thanksgiving they had as a family before his mother demanded the divorce and his father moved out the following January. Brian already knew the secret, but did not know it would cause them to break up and thought it might work out. The secret that his father still did not know, but that he would try to tell him when he saw him. The meal had been turkey and they cooked it in the backyard in the barbecue over charcoal with the lid down tight. His father had put hickory chips on the charcoal and the smell of the cooking turkey and the hickory smoke had filled the yard. When his father took the lid off smiling, the smell that had come out was unbelievable. And when they sat to eat, the meat was wet with juice and rich and had the taste of the smoke in it. He had to stop this. 
His mouth was full of saliva and his stomach was twisting and growling. What was there to eat? What had he read or seen that told him about food in the wilderness? Hadn't there been something? A show. Yeah, a show on television about Air Force pilots and some kind of course they took. A survival course. All right. He had the show coming into his thoughts now. The pilots had to live in the desert. They put them in the desert down in Arizona or someplace, and they had to live for a week. They had to find food or water for a week. For water, they had made a sheet of plastic into a dew-gathering device, and for food, they ate lizards. Ew. Yum. All right. It's what you got. It's what you got. That's right, Greg. You got to deal with what you got. You got to make the best of it, right? That was it. Like Don't it. eat raw. We ate squirrel. We ate squirrel. Mother. Squirrel. All right. Okay. Well, Keep in mind, though, right now, does he have any way to cook anything? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. So we're talking raw squirrel with fur still on it, raw no, that lizard. Can, that can give you diseases, and, they, and that gets really high cholesterol. Squirrel does. Yeah. So, he could die so I don't think you can eat raw squirrel. What about alligators? You can eat bugs. Okay, he's in Canada. There's not an alligator. You can eat bugs. I mean, bugs. Bugs, all right. You can. I've seen that on that Survivor show. They eat bugs and worms and stuff. Okay. All right. That was it. Of course, Brian had lots of water. And there weren't too many lizards in the Canadian woods that he knew. One of the pilots had used a watch crystal as a magnifying glass to focus the sun and start a fire. So they didn't have to eat the lizard draw. But Brian had a digital watch without a crystal broken at that. So the show didn't help him much. Wait, there was one thing. One of the pilots, a woman, had found some kind of beans on a bush, and she had used them with her lizard meat to make a little stew in a tin can she'd found. Bean lizard stew. There weren't any beans here that he saw, but there must be berries. There had to be berry bushes around. Sure, the woods were full of berry bushes. That's what everybody always said. Well, he doesn't ever actually heard anybody say it, but he felt that it should be true. What do you guys think? Do you think there probably should be berry bushes around? Yeah, maybe like, like one or two. Wait. Uh, okay. Wait. Sean, what do you think? Um, well, when it said, um, start fire with like a little Uh-huh. When, um, Alvin and the chicks moved, um, when they went to the island, they used Simon's glasses to start a fire. Okay. Um, when it said use the magnifying glass to start a fire, that reminded Sean he made a text to movie connection. Um, the Alvin and the Chipmunks shipwreck, Chipwrecked movie where they're on the island, if you've seen that one. Um, and they used Simon's glasses to focus the sun. Um, so that's another way that you could do that. Zeke would be fine. He's got glasses. Lily's good. It is a good connection. Something about the berries from Zeke. Okay. In there, there should probably be blackberries if it's the right mm. Well, it depends on the time of year. It was summer. And so it's summer, so there probably will be blackberries. Oh, and uh, some of the berries are poison stuff. And I have another thing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Pause. Let berries. me catch them up because I can't hear you. Okay, Zeke's talking about berry bushes. And he said that since it's the summer, he thinks there's probably going to be blackberries around. Blackberries. Um, blackberries do grow in the summer. I know we usually, when it's not COVID, go to Eckert's and like pick blackberries and peaches in the summer and it's always like crazy hot and we're sweating to death um but he also reminded us that some wild berries can be poisonous what about raspberries why i don't remember where when raspberries grow so we'll find out all right zeke has one more thing you cannot all talk at the same time be respectful one thing is i have a magnifying glass on my swiss army knife and i use it to all right, Zeke also is making a self-to-text connection that his little Swiss Army knife has a little tiny magnifying glass as part of it, one of the things he's got on it, and that it's he has little. used it to burn paper before. It's great. It's a big one. Swiss Congratulations, Army. Zeke. All right, here we go. Zeke, Continuing on. Kendall, yes, ma'am. I did not mean to have my thing raised. Okay. Never mind then. Love you. Okay, here we go. There must be berry bushes. He stood and moved out into the sand and looked up at the sun. It was still high. He didn't know what time it must be. At home, it would be one or two if the sun were that high. At home, at one or two, his mother would be putting away the lunch dishes and getting ready for her exercise class. No, that would have been yesterday. Today, she would be going to see him. 
Today was Thursday, and she always went to see him on Thursdays. Wednesday was the exercise class, and Thursdays she went to see him. Hot little jets of hate worked into his thoughts, pushed once, moved back. If his mother hadn't begun to see him and forced the divorce, Brian wouldn't be here now. That's why the him. guy that she saw a mom with in the car. But we don't know his name. We don't know his name yet. But we know he has blonde hair. He does have blonde hair. They did tell us that. He shook his head, had to stop that kind of thinking. The sun was still high, and that meant he had some time before darkness to find berries. He didn't want to be away from his, he almost thought of it as home, shelter when it came to be dark. He didn't want to be anywhere in the woods when it came to be dark, and he didn't want to get lost, which would be a real problem. All he knew in the world was the lake in front of him and the hill at the back and the ridge. If he lost sight of them, there was a really good chance he would get turned around and not find his way back. So he had to look for berry bushes, but keep the lake or the rock ridge in sight at all times. He looked up the lake shore to the north. For a good distance, perhaps 200 yards, it was fairly clear. There were tall pines, the kind with no limbs up until very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them, but not too much low brush. 200 yards up, there seemed to be a belt of thick lower brush starting, about 10 or 12 feet high, and that formed a wall he could not see through. It seemed to go on around the lake, thick and lushly green, but he could not be sure. If there were berries, they would be in that brush, he felt. And as long as he stayed close to the lake so he could keep the water on his right and know it was there, he wouldn't get lost. When he was done or found berries, he thought, he would just turn around so the water was on his left and walk back until he came to the ridge and his shelter. Simple. It's keep it water. simple. I am Brian Robinson. I have been in a plane crash. I'm going to find some food. I'm going to find berries. That makes me feel like I'm going on a bear hunt. I'm going to find a big one. It, that kind of made me feel like that when I was just reading it. Yeah. Swish, she swashy, swish, she swashy. Okay, anyway, carry on. Um, text to text connection. We're making connections in this chapter. We're not finding similes and metaphors. We're making connections. Okay, here we go. He walked slowly, still a bit pained in his joints and weak from hunger, up along the side of the lake. The trees were full of birds singing ahead of him in the sun. Some he knew, some he didn't. He saw a robin and some kind of sparrows and a flock of reddish-orange birds with thick beaks. Twenty or thirty of them were sitting in one of the pines. They made much noise and flew ahead of him when he walked under the tree. He watched them fly, their color a bright slash and solid green. And in this way, he found the berries. The birds landed in some taller willow type of undergrowth with wide leaves and started jumping and making noise. At first, he was too far away to see what they were doing, but their color drew him and he moved toward them, keeping the lake in sight on his right. And when he got closer, he saw they were eating berries. Um, Jason. Actually, I did find a uh, simile. His leg felt like rubber. Oh, it did say his legs felt like rubber. And his arms were something. Okay. okay. All right. Um, okay, so yeah, there was some figurative language there when he said his legs were rubber. Okay. Um, he could not believe it was that easy. It was as if the birds had taken him right to the berries. The slender branches went up about 20 feet and were heavy, drooping with clusters of bright red berries. They were half as big as grapes, but hung in bunches much like grapes. And when Brian saw them glistening red in the sunlight, he almost yelled. His pace quickened and he was in them in moments, scattering the birds, grabbing branches, stripping them to fill his mouth with berries. He almost spit them out. It wasn't that they were bitter so much as they lacked any sweetness, had a tart flavor that left his mouth dry feeling. And they were like cherries in that they had large pits, which made them hard to chew. But there was such a hunger on him, such an emptiness, that he could not stop and kept stripping branches and eating berries by the handful, grabbing and jamming them into his mouth and swallowing them, pits and all. Josie. That kind of reminds me of, I have a bush out there. It reminds me because I know what size grapes are, and they're a little bit smaller than grapes, and they're clusters too, and they're bright red. But they're poisonous. It remember whenever I put that um one of them out there by that mushroom while we were doing the mold experiment to see what right. it did? 
that's the kind of berry that I'm talking about. I don't know. It sounds a lot like that. Been told by your family that they're poisonous and not to eat them. Oh. Huh. That's oh. Oh. Oops. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, Zeke did tell us that po wild berries could be poisonous. And yeah, Josie says, this sounds like the ones in my yard and they're poisonous. Um, all right. Are we worried about Mr. Robinson right now? Maggie, what are your thoughts? Uh, Listening. When we were first like moved to a home, mm -hmm. they ran straight to the bushes and started eating them. And I was just standing there watching them. And they and then they started spitting them out with like, Hey, these are these are berries. Maggie said she made a connection, um, self connection that um when they first moved to their house, um, her brothers ran, there was a bush with berries and they ran to start eating the berries and they had to spit them out because they were nasty. Um, Riley. I so I my grandma's house, there's like this berry bush in the backyard, and my aunt and her friend, these berries are like super small and they're red, but my aunt and her friend went to the backyard, ate them, they come up to the front yard, and they like spit them out, and they're like, eh, they're not good. Riley also made a connection where at her aunt's house, they ate the berries on the bushes, and then they had to spit them out because they were gross. Zeke. Um, so there's this, well, um. We have this blackberry bush in our backyard, so we have tons of blackberry bushes and next to each other. And uh, so the next to the blackberry bushes is this poisonous, uh, it's like a tree. And it's like really, it's like that wide around the trunk is. And then there's like these red berries that grow in bushes. I think it's what Josie's talking about. And then another thing is there's this uh, tree in Canada that has these green berries on it. And they're like uh, as big as an apple. They're not that big, but they're pretty big and then they're green. And if you stand under while it rains, it can kill you. Like, they're so heavy? Yeah. All right. So Zeke was saying that he also, they have blackberry bushes. They call them bushes, but blackberries grow more on like a vine yeah, type thing. Um, bushes, but like I know the ones we pick at Eckert's are more like a vine because they have them running up like a big fence thing. Um, but in my backyard, I do have like way in the back, some wild blackberry bushes. Um, and they're like really thorny. Um, and yeah, it's hard to, are. hard to pick Why them the because the there's tree? the berries are, the wild blackberries are tiny and the thorns are big. Oh, yeah, um, are Josie's going to take a picture. Um, that would be awesome. Um, and then Zeke was also telling us about a tree he read about in Canada that has actually like large, heavy berries that are bigger and, um, they're green. And when it rains, it causes them to fall. And well, it causes them to fall. It makes the uh, oil from it that fall off of it. And if it falls on you, it makes an oil from the tree fall off of it, and then it could kill you or something. Okay, Riley, one more thing, and then we're gonna keep reading. Uh, I used to have a blackberry uh, vine in my backyard. She used to have a blackberry vine. But then they all died. And then they died. Okay. <laughs> he was swallowing them pits and all. He could not stop, and when at last his stomach was full, he was still hungry. Two days without food must have shrunken his stomach, but the drive of hunger was still there. Thinking of the birds and how they would come back into the berries when he left, he made a carrying pouch of his torn windbreaker and kept picking. Finally, when he judged he had close to four pounds in the jacket, he stopped and went back to his camp by the ridge. Now, he thought, now I have some food, and I can do something about fixing this place up. He glanced at the sun and saw he had some time before dark. Now, let me pause here because I thought of something. He says that the birds are eating the berries. So are they poisonous? Well, birds have different stomachs, too. They can, they, they adapt to their habitat. Like we talked about, like, uh, evolving. Like, they adapt to their habitat and their stomachs can get used to the things over years that they okay have in their so zeke said that he's thinking that birds could have different stomachs and like we talked about in science the animals have their niche or they can evolve that that bird that particular bird is able to eat those berries and its stomach is strong enough to handle it where a person's stomach that's not used to living yeah, out like in the wild would not uh, be able to handle it 
Okay, he said pandas can eat bamboo, but if you just eat bamboo, it's poisonous to humans. I did not know that. That's new information for me. Um, okay, if only, oh, Sean. Okay, so this is still about the berries. Still about the berries, okay. Um, I, I don't have a book or a vine. They can write about berries for a That's not about the berries. There are and different types um, of blackberries. Sean says he has blackberries my growing my on a tree. Uncle's house, um, they had strawberries that we weren't allowed to eat them. So he told us to go pick the wild strawberries. I didn't know if it was ours. But then he told me they were like these like little strawberries that grew on like these plants in the ground. Okay, yep. Strawberries grow on a plant on the ground. Strawberries are really low to the ground. Um, Josie, yes. Honestly, even if they were okay for you to eat, uh, think of all the stuff that's on them. Like, we used to have a peach tree, and we got peaches every year, and, like, there were worms in some of them, and it was, we had to wash them so much, like, three times. They were, they were really, really dirty, so either way, he's going to get, like, some bad thing from them in him. Right. Like he didn't wash them off or anything. He got them straight from the bush in his mouth. So like dirt from being outside and rain and um, well, there's birds sitting all over them. Mold maybe around there. All right. So here we go. Let's find out what happens. If only I had matches, he thought, looking ruefully at the beach and lakeside. There was driftwood everywhere, not to mention dead and dry wood all over the hill and dead dry branches hanging from every tree. All firewood and no matches. How did they used to do it, he thought. Rub two sticks together? He tucked the berries in the pouch back in under the overhang in the cool shade and found a couple of sticks. After 10 minutes of rubbing, he felt the sticks and they were almost cool to the touch. Not that, he thought. They didn't do fire that way. He threw the sticks down in disgust. So no fire. But he could still fix the shelter and make it. Here, the word safer came into his mind and he didn't know why. Seemed to make it more livable. Kind of close in it, he thought. I'll just close it in a bit. He started dragging sticks up from the lake and pulling long dead branches down from the hill, never getting out of sight of the water and the ridge. With these, he interlaced and wove a wall across the opening of the front of the rock. It took over two hours, and he had to stop several times because he still felt a bit weak, and once because he felt a strange new twinge in his stomach, a tightening, rolling, too many berries, he thought. I ate too many of them. But it was gone soon, and he kept working until the entire front of the overhang was covered, save for a small opening at the right end nearest the lake. The doorway was about three feet, and when he went in, he found himself in a room almost 15 feet long and eight to 10 feet deep, with the rock wall sloping down at the rear. Good, he said, nodding. Good. Outside, the sun was going down, finally. And in the initial coolness, the mosquitoes came out again and clouded in on him. They were thick, terrible, if not quite as bad as in the morning. And he kept brushing them off in his arms until he couldn't stand it and then dumped the berries and put the torn windbreaker on. At least the sleeves covered his arms. Wrapped in the jacket with darkness coming down fast now, he crawled back in under the rock and huddled and tried to sleep. He was deeply tired and still aching some, but sleep was slow coming and did not finally settle in until the evening cool turned to night cool and the mosquitoes slowed. Then at last, with his stomach turning on the berries, Brian went to sleep. Ian. All right, we're going to stop there. And actually, um, virtual friends, listen up. We're going to discuss some of the simile metaphor stuff. But the assignment I want you to actually do is because more than um, I found similes and metaphors in this um, chapter, I thought there was a lot of imagery. Like I thought it, we really got kind of a picture of what Brian was seeing and like this little shelter that he built. So I want you to kind of look back through the chapter and we might actually... Um, do yeah let's not do the simile metaphor thing today we'll save that for a different day so virtual friends you do not need to do the lesson six worksheets okay instead 
what I want you to do, and I will change this on Seesaw. Instead, what I want you guys to do is to draw a picture and probably easiest, I will say don't use Seesaw to draw. Um, draw a picture of what you think the shelter and the lake and everything looks like, the berry bushes, try and include all the different things that talked about in this chapter on um, how you're picturing Brian's little area of the Canadian wilderness. How are you picturing that as um, our author, Mr. Gary Paulson was writing this? Um, can you just draw cute decorations? No, you need to draw what is explained in the chapter. Okay. Um, all right. So for you guys, I would say use an actual piece of paper and then take a picture of it because drawing on seesaw would be way too difficult to give me the detail um, that I would hopefully be looking for. But it described what a shelter looks like. It's got like a rock overhang kind of scooped out. Then he built the wooden wall with tree branches woven together. There's berry bushes somewhere on the other side of the lake. There's a rock wall somewhere. Um, so it told us what the lake was shaped like. Shh, 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 don't say. Um, like I literally was like, shh, don't say. You're fired. Um, okay. So I want you to draw a picture of what you think Brian sees when he wakes up now. And this is his new normal and his new where he is okay so that's the assignment for today i'm going to change this activity in seesaw for you guys so give me just a moment some of you already did it um draw a detailed picture using the can I just send it in like blank? Yeah, you can. Chapter six and and draw a detailed picture. But if you give me a second, I'll take it off and it won't even be there anymore. Hang on. Read chapter six of Hatch and draw a detailed picture using the imagery and descriptions from the chapter the picture of the lake. Brian's shelter and the surrounding area using the imagery and descriptions from the chapter. Use colors and details in your drawing. Okay. All right. Don't tell him I'm going to send this back. Okay, those of you that might have already sent it to me, I'm sending it back to you. Um, Cam, I sent it back to you. And Kaylee, I'm sending it back to you. Okay, so um, give me, two. if you guys hit refresh, you should have the updated one. So, I, like I said, just draw a picture and then on paper and then take a picture. I better put that on there, do not use Seesaw. Okay, let me get them a piece of paper. Let me turn record off for you guys and you guys should be set.